Hello, everyone. I'm Isabel Newton. I'm an interventional radiologist from UCSD in the VA in San Diego. And this is not my first COA. I'm happy to be back. You guys are a great group of people. Uh, and I'm going to be talking today about what could be a very dry topic, but can actually save your life. So I appreciate the opportunity to tell you about it. These are my disclosures. So we're going to talk a little bit about how these images are generated. Because if you know how they're made, you know how to optimize them, you know how to protect yourself, you know how to protect that person next to you and your patient. So let's first kind of do the anatomy of the C-arm here. The source is where the x-rays come from, the photons come from, and they pass through the patient and are received at the detector in a differential pattern which creates your image, right? There's this thing called the automatic exposure control, which is like a feedback mechanism that says, I've received enough photons, I'm gonna shut it off. Or maybe I have not, so I need to pump up the volume. There are ways to optimize this image, and so there are things like collimators that remove excess um, parts that are not you know, contributing to the image, either whether it be air or part anatomy that is not important for what you're looking at. There are grids that remove photons that are not of um, energies that create an image that's um, discernible. Um, and other filtration things that we do, and then a whole lot of computer stuff that happens at the top that um, can be used to optimize imaging at, that is not at a cost of more photons. Here's that automatic exposure control. It's really important for you to know because you guys use things that are very high density. So if you leave you know, a, a surgical instrument in the field and it doesn't really need to be there, your AEC is pumping photons because it's trying to get something to drive through this thing that's impenetrable. So keep that in mind. It's also important to understand this concept of scatter radiation because this is the radiation to you, okay? So scatter radiation is highest where the beam is incident on the patient and goes out in these kinds of clouds. And the farther away you are from this point of where the beam hits the patient, the lower the radiation is to you. That's the inverse square law. I use this all the time. I take a step back when we do a fluoroscopy run. I also like to stand behind very attenuating fellows. Um, but if you don't have an attenuating fellow, you might have a skirt. And if you see that, that will modify um, sort of the cloud of radiation around. So understanding how these photons fly around, they go linearly, they're not going to curve around in this sneaky little fashion. You can use all of your, um, sh your drapes and your shields in an effective way. And I've had two pregnancies where I worked all the way up to literally the moment I delivered as an IR, and only one of them is a little strange. So physics is not just for physicists. What you want to know is how these things are created so that you can create diagnostic images and understand your artifacts and protect everyone involved. So let's talk about photons. There are two things that you really need to know. What's, one is attenuation. So these are the photons that are absorbed by your subject. They do not reach the detector and they contribute to dose. Anything that's absorbed by the subject contributes to dose. It also contributes to the image because those photons that don't show up there are sort of, you, you infer that there's something in the way, right? Whereas penetration are those photons that pass through the subject and reach the detector. Those actually contribute to the image as a photon that gets to the detector. So when we talk about properties of the beam, it's important to understand two concepts. One is the energy of the photons, which is described as the KV. Higher voltage means that they have greater penetration. So all the photons are gonna get there and you'll have lower contrast. If all photons get there, you got no image, right? So you want the differential arrival of these photons. Then there's the number of photons, that's the MA. So more photons that you have, the higher chance for um, some to reach the, the detector, but also there's a higher chance of attenuation. So when you talk about how does this differential arrival um, get sort of dictated, it's dictated by the density of the tissues. So something with a high atomic number or high Z is going to um, block more photons. And you know, we radiologists understand this very well, that the least dense is air and the highest density is metal. And you guys know this too, right? And so everything in between. Then there's the thickness of tissues. So if you have a really obese patient and you're operating on their hip, um, you're going to have to drive a whole lot more photons in to see them than if you have a very thin patient and you're looking at their hand. Also, bigger tissues or thicker tissues produce more scatter, so you're going to get more radiation to yourself. 
All right, I do not know anything about um, sports, so I'm just trying to relate to my audience, so hang with me here. So radiation interactions are like football. Here's a little guy, he's a photon, he's trying to get the detector, nothing's in his way, he gets there. You put in this um, person who's high atomic number, they're very thick, they're not, he's not gonna reach the detector. So how do we overcome that? We can add a more energetic photon, higher KV, let him drive through. He may or may not make it. Or we can add more photons that are also of higher energy. So you see how in these different ways of modulating the beam, we have a higher um, ability to get the photons of the detector. But there is a cost, right? The cost is dose. Cost to the patient and cost to you. They are proportionate. So even if you're not a nice person who cares about your patient, if all you care about yours is yourself, you still need to watch out for dose. And of course, the densest um, patients and the densest um, materials will attenuate all the beams. This is something I do know, art. Um, and uh, when we talk about noise in an image, the noise is that kind of pixelated appearance, right? And this, these are, um, this is Seurat, you know, the Pontalis painter. And it, you, you still understand that on the left is the Eiffel Tower, and on the right is a um, self-portrait. You can make this diagnosis, per se, without having something that's perfectly clear, and that's what I want to express to you. You don't have to have a picture that you're going to publish, like the images at the top. You can already tell it's a guy with a camera by the second image. So what's the highest um, source of noise in an image? It's called quantum model, which is something you can just say casually at a cocktail party to sound really smart. Um, what it is, it's the differential arrival of these um, photons to a detector and that kind of um, randomness about it. Okay, and the fewer that you have, the more pontalistic it looks. So factors affecting noise are thick tissues, magnification, because you're having to you're, um, drive these photons through a smaller area, the duration of acquisition. You know, you guys step on floor and you articulate um, a, you know, a joint, and the longer floor pulses or the longer times are going to have um, higher noise if there's motion blurring. And then scattered radiation, if it bounces off of you and hits the detector, that's nonsense photons. Those are gonna add more noise. These are images from a standard IR procedure, but I think it really illustrates um, the effect of noise. In the first image on the left, you see the arm, right? That is creating more photon removal, so you get um, more of that quantum model. In the middle, someone didn't collimate. They included more air, so you get this burned out image. And the last one, you get the best image. Now, I can use any one of these to make the diagnosis that I want to make, but I can actually reduce the amount of radiation if I'm cognizant. This also brings up the point of where to stand. You know, the highest radiation is near the source. So if you are always away from the source, the farthest way you can get from the source, that's going to be the lowest radiation to yourself. And so for us in IR, when we do a lateral view, I don't care if the lateral view is this way or that way. We see sideways through the patient either way. So I always swing the detector towards myself. And people think, oh, goodness, it, you know, you have the, the source that's pointing right at you. Well, that's actually not how it goes because the patient eclipses most of the photons, okay? So I always get questions about mini C arms. Mini C arms are not mini radiation. If you look at actually um, the similar geometry, mini C arms provide better images, but it's the, at the cost of more radiation and more scatter. Here are some um, radiation doses for common procedures that you guys do. You are um, exposed to far less radiation than we are in IR. That doesn't mean you should be far less concerned. So we're gonna try to use these, um, this dose wisely to make diagnostic, not gorgeous images, and how. To kind of um, summarize, the factors that affect dose are the energy of the beam and the number of um, photons. The beam geometry means like how close you have the patient to the source versus to the detector, and then the attenuation of the beam by your patient. Remember, if you remember nothing else, the scattered radiation is proportionate to the dose to the patient. Okay, so Alara helps all of us. And I'm sorry we're blowing through this, but um, this is what we got. So now we get onto the safety part. and We understand the biological effects of radiation, which I will start with the caveat that the biological effects at low dose radiation are still um, a subject of uh, some debate among the more elite uh, physicist circles. I don't think any of those people are here today, but I'm happy to engage in that conversation offline. 
So you can divide these effects of radiation into stochastic versus deterministic, which are very simplistic um, kind of categories but are useful for our purposes. The stochastic effects depend on chance. They may or may not happen. There's no threshold at which they occur. And there is no um, magnitude of the, of the um, sort of occurrence when it happens. So a really tiny dose can result in a terrible cancer. A big dose can result in nothing at all. It's, it's just all up to chance. And the things that we really think about are radiation-induced cancer and germline defects. How do we measure that? Well, kind of an idea of it is the dose area product. If you've ever looked at these um, radiation reports that people have, um, the dose area product is this big number, and there is um, nothing that, no sense that I can make of it except to say that I look at it to say, is it similar to other um, DAPs for this type of procedure? You know, if I'm doing a big tips, it's going to be big. If I'm doing a tiny little, you know, transjugular liver biopsy, it's going to be small. So I kind of look at it that way. But there's no threshold, right? And you should do the same thing for your procedure. So get an idea of what these DAPs are. The more useful numbers are when we look at, um, at the, uh, the next slide, actually in a couple slides. Um, so let's look actually at um, our radiation um, sensitivity. It goes down as we get older. So all of our trainees, you know, a lot of you are in private practice, but maybe you have young partners, they're going to be more radio sensitive. And especially if you have female um, partners, they're gonna be more radio sensitive than your older and male partners. I don't see that many women orthopods here. Raise your hand, come in strong. All right, ladies. Yes, good. Yeah, you're even fewer than an IR. We're 9%. Got you beat. Um, so, and this again, it goes down with age. Just be cognizant of this um, and make sure that people have um, adequate protection, which we'll get to. The deterministic effects, which was, was the slide that I was so excited to get to, um, shows the effects of radiation that occur after a threshold dose. And that threshold dose is agreed to be about two gray, okay, or 2,000 milligray. After that, at certain levels, you get erythema, you get um, the hair loss, cataracts, which are kind of considered to be um, a mashup of both stochastic and deterministic, um, highest levels, infertility, impaired hematopoiesis, and even death. How do we know this? Some really terrible human experiments. So air kerma is a number that I look at very much. Um, and it's because once we get over that dose, I start to pay close attention. You know, we did this really big procedure on Friday, and we were pushing up over that dose. And I said, guys, we need to wrap this up soon. Um, so if you look at air kerma here, it's 1.4 gray or 1.5 gray. We're still not at the 2 gray level. But just be cognizant of this, because this is where we sort of know that things begin to happen. And what happens, um, and this is kind of you know, these threshold doses are kind of estimated, um, is that you can have at greater than 12 gray dermal necrosis. Now this is if you just turn on the beam, focus it at one point, and you don't move. Most of the time we spread out the beam. You guys are articulating, moving things around. So you may have less skin dose per field. So be cognizant of that as well. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, cataracts. You know, there is a certain kind of cataract that you can get from radiation. There are posterior subcapsular opacities that can then um, progress to actual cataracts. If you go to the ophthalmologist, I wouldn't suggest that you go specialty, you know, especially for this, but if you go there, tell them that you use radiation and tell them to look for those opacities. And that um, kind of alerts them to your, um, to your uh, you know, risk of this. You must wear protection, right? Because our eyes are very important to us. I mean, I'm a you know, radiologist. I, I joke sometimes that IR is all feel and I could be blind, but that is not true. I need my eyes. So for those of you who are um, as brutish as your reputation uh, may say, which I do not believe at all, I know you are all very, very smart people, um, deterministic effects are like drinking, right? So you must consume a threshold of alcohol to get drunk. After that, um, the more you drink, the more drunk you get. And some of these effects are irreversible and some could even be fatal, right? Stochastic effects, on the other hand, are like gambling, you know, or at least like playing the lottery. So even if you enter the lottery once, you could be a winner of the worst, you know, prize ever. If you buy more tickets, which is a kind of like more dose, you, you have more times to play um, and more chances of winning. But the size or the value of your prize is, ir um, is irrespective with that. So how much radiation is okay? Well, 
there are recommended recommended amounts and you can um, go to the international commission on radiologic protection and they say 100 millisieverts over five years or a max of 50 millisieverts in any one year and so if you are wa wearing your um, radiation um, detector um, you will be monitored for this and you will be alerted if you exceed any of these um, levels and this is based on a um, radiation risk of working for 47 years, um, starting at age 18. I don't know who does that, but um, at a rate of 20 millisieverts per year, okay? And that if, um, is estimated to give you an excess risk of cancer of one in 1,000. Well, most of us don't have that kind of uh, a career for that long, but that's where it comes from, so you understand. So what's the typical dose to you guys um, using proper radiation protection? Well, good news, it's less than two millisieverts Per year. So you have a low dose, but as I mentioned, we don't know that low, low doses, that there's any low dose that's safe. And I, you know, if anybody wants to come talk to me about hormesis, I'll shoot you down later. All right, so radiation protection. This is how you protect yourself. Who knew that Superman was going to be so beneficial for my points? Um, there are four primary methods of radiation protection. One is time. Minimize the time that the beam is on. Two, distance, I already told you about the inverse square law, the um, radiation drops off precipitously as you take a step back. Shielding, um, this is the shielding that you wear, the shielding that you use. And then um, reduce dose to the patient by collimating, so you in, um, decrease your field of view to only the area of interest and avoid placing any instruments that don't have to be there. And I know you have instruments that you need for retraction and patients have big, you know, um, metallic uh, implants and that kind of thing that can't be avoided, but there are sometimes um, when you can remove things. And then there are dose sparing techniques that you can use on your fluoroscopy machine that the technologist should be, allow, be able to help you with. Uh, this is just a setup in the IR suite. Um, you can see that acrylic shield, uh, which is over here. Um, oops, let's see, no. Um, I guess I can't point at it, but um, that actually attenuates some of the scatter radiation to our faces and our chest. Uh, the skirt that's down below is that thing that, that uh, reduces the uh, radiation to um, our gonadal region, which helps ensure the future of, of more IRs and more um, uh, orthopods in the future. And then you see on um, C on the right is kind of a shield where our, our anesthesiologists or our nurses can stand behind, and that's a very attenuating shield as well. Here are some images from um, paper that I'd like to, I think it's probably in your syllabus. There are two papers from the American Journal of Radiology that talk about these concepts, but um, these are different eyewear that you can use. Basically, the bottom line is, is the more you look like a minion, the more um, you know, attenuating and better it is. So try not to look so cool. People ask me whether you should wear a lead cap. I say no, because if these photons enter um, from below your glasses, which they can do if you don't tilt them down um, about 10 to 15 degrees, as is illustrated in, in E on the left, um, they will go into your head and not have a way out. Um, so it, it traps more photons. It's not, it, I, I don't wear those. Um, lead aprons, yes. And what lead apron do you buy? You buy the one that you can tolerate. Um, they're gonna tell you all these different things about um, you know, the different weights. These are all tested at um, beams that are not uh, relevant for what you're doing. You, you know, when you get, um, scatter radiation, the energy isn't the energy that's getting passed through the patient, right? It's a lower energy. So just the, the one that you can wear and not have um, MSK issues is the one you should buy. Uh, do not put your hands in the field if you can stand it, um, or you might end up like this. Um, people ask me, you know, should I wear um, these uh, attenuating gloves? My answer is no because what's gonna happen? The automatic exposure control is gonna pump more photons through, so you're gonna end up causing more scatter to everyone. So just minimize your time in the field. You do have a risk of radiation-induced arthritis. One of the best IRs in San Diego County had to retire due to that. But he was doing a lot of biliary interventions, and we have our hands all up in there. People ask me also about the cream. The cream has an FDA warning um, because it has a higher um, chance of infection, so no, no, no. So remember, uh, fluoroscopy can be a very powerful tool. Um, there's no harmless dose of radiation, so you should fear it, but use it. And so the more you know, the better you can use it um, for, the use of, for the benefit of your patients. Remember that the dose to you is mainly from scatter, and bigger patients and more attenuating patients are going to produce more scatter. So you want to take measures to reduce um, dose to you and to the person next to you and to your patient. Any questions? Look at that, 28 seconds. 